Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. Welcome to the NAACP Forum. You all know we are Broxton's choice for civil rights news. We are continuing our coverage of the district attorney election here in Plymouth County. And guess who's in the studio today? The district attorney of Plymouth County, Timothy Cruz. Sir, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Rumor is the 17 years on the job. Is that true? That's correct. Well, so why don't you tell, and I, I'll, I tell everybody when they come into the studio, it's just like being in my living room. Tell me, why should we give you another four years? Well, I think that, you know, during the course of the last 17 years, we've had a, an awful lot of good positive success that's occurred, not just here in Brockton, but in the county throughout. Mm -hmm. Right now, you know, we've, we just moved to, to Main Street in Brockton from our, our right. old place at 32 Belmont. And we, I like to say that we moved two tenths of a mile, but we moved 75 years into the future wow. because the building is beautiful and we were able to consolidate a lot of other offices together. Good. So right now we have that 30,000 square feet over there, including moving the state police who mm. were assigned to the DA's office. They're right now in downtown Brockton. They had been in Middleborough for years. That's right, years. that's right, right. So they're here now, and granted, they're not doing specifically the work of the Brockton police, obviously, <coughs> but visibility and presence is a real big thing. So I'm really glad that they're here. And I think it's, uh, we also moved one of our IT uh, and computer uh, forensics. Mm -hmm. They were also up here right now. And I think that, that, once again, that visibility and presence is a really big deal here in the city. So when you look at your, your, your performance, what sticks out in you if you want to do three asterisks of what you have been successful in doing in the last 17 years, or, or listen, or, or for the last four years, yeah. that you say that these prosecutions is what has improved the community? I think that, you know, first and foremost, dealing with the opiate crisis that's yes. going on right now, that is such an epidemic and it's killing people and destroying families. I think everybody knows somebody that has passed away or had an overdose, mm -hmm. and we need to make sure we can help the people that we can help, and I truly believe that. So three years back, myself and the Sheriff Joe McDonald put together the Plymouth County Drug Abuse Task Force. And really what that is, was getting people who understand specifically certain aspects of our community. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with not just law enforcement, not, not just police or judges, although mm -hmm. they're involved. Right, right, uh, right. We're dealing with also faith-based people. We're dealing with education, hospitals, and we're trying to get information to make that task force kind of a clearinghouse, if you will. So all that information we can get, get best practices, distribute it back out to the community. And nothing but good things have come out of that. We've had uh, mm -hmm. a great collaboration between all of our police departments here in Plymouth County. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this turned into what's known as Plymouth County Outreach. And what outreach is, and it's been going on now for about a year and a half or so, uh, all 27 police departments in, this, in, the, in, the, in Plymouth County, yes. and also Bridgewater State University Police, <coughs> now are collecting data through, through our program and finding out where the overdose is occurring when are they occurring, and most importantly what they're doing, if there's a non-fatal overdose, say here in Brockton, mm -hmm. but the person may be from Plymouth, the Brockton police will notify <coughs> the Plymouth police, and the next day within 12 to 24 hours, a recovery coach and a plainclothes police officer will show up bringing information to that family to try to get help to that person right. who is overdosing uh, because they're in the throes of it. Yes, and one of the yes. biggest problems we have is the stigma of it. People right. are embarrassed by it still. Right, right. We have to break the stigma. We have to help those people. So PCO, Plymouth County Outreach, now gives us the numbers and the information that we're dealing with. And we're also figuring out how many actual fatal opi opioid overdoses we really have. Mm -hmm. We thought for years that you know the, the, poli the troopers who work for me, mm -hmm. they go to all what's known as unattended deaths. So if somebody passes away, say, at your home, in right. natural causes, and the local police will come, right. they will notify the state police who will come make sure there's nothing suspicious. However, if you pass away in a hospital, right. or if you pass away in a nursing home, we won't get that call because that's an attended death. Right. So right. in trying to figure out the real numbers, how bad is our problem? And where do we have to put our resources, our limited resources, to make sure we can help get rid of that problem? So I hear, the, I hear families that, are, that talk about they have a, a son or daughter that's drug addicted, and they are repeat offenders in terms of they're doing larceny, uh, the shoplifting yeah. or something like that. What have, have you given any specific instructions to your ADA when someone you know that they, they're coming, well, you don't know, but when they come before, um, they have an arrest, they come before uh, you all in terms of prosecution, and you find out, they're basically drug addicts. Yeah. Have you given any instructions on your ADA, ADA to maybe sort of do that sort of drug 
drug court model. What's your instructions to your district attorneys? Well, we, we don't have a drug court model. We have a drug court. We you have a drug court. We actually yeah. have one in Brockton, Hingham, in Plymouth, mm -hmm. and now we're getting one in Wareham. So right now, is successful. That, suc I think they're successful. They okay. take a long time. I mean, Judge Vitale does a great job up here in Brockton. You know, Judge Sullivan down in Plymouth. Judge Bradley over in Hingham. Mm -hmm. And Wareham is going to be our fourth one. Mm. And really, what it is, and you, and you talk to the judges, and you talk to mm -hmm. you know, people that are in the throes of this of this epidemic. Mm -hmm. You know, it, usually it doesn't work. When you give them help, and you put them into maybe a place where they can get some help. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work the first time or even the second time. Mm -hmm. People, get, they re reuse, they reoffend, And it's not unusual for people to go to drug court and then they reoffend, and then we have to start from scratch again also. So what we do is try to make sure we can get them the services that we can get them, mm -hmm. hold them accountable for what they did, and make sure that you know we're in the situation, if they, if they stole something from you, we've got to deal with that. We can't just ignore that. That needs to be taken care of. And I think what we end up seeing, a lot of the people that have this, this, this terrible disease, right, right. they're at the end of the line. They, their families have all turned their backs on them because the disease is so powerful that you will end up stealing from your mother, stealing from your father, yes. stealing from your kids. Right. And we know that and we see that. So we, what we have to do and what the government, I believe, mm -hmm. has to do a little better job of mm -hmm. is get us more beds and facilities for the people who are dealing with this issue. What I see happening, uh, Tony, is that we have a lot of problems in our community mm -hmm. that end up in the criminal justice system, well, that's what, yeah, which that's, is not right, really ready right, for that. Right, right, and, and, we, and we know that. Um, so y y clearly you're on top of the, the opiate addi uh, addiction. Now, I'm looking at advertisement and I'm seeing that uh, particular folks are saying that the DA is responsible for the reduction of gun violence. Now, that's actually kind of new to me. Does the, is that really the responsibility of the district attorney to reduce gun violence? I mean, you guys prosecute the cases at sure. the end. Would it speak to that? Are you responsible for a reduction of gun violence? I think we're responsible for reaching out and getting additional avenues to help the police. Gotcha. You know, and so yeah. what we've done here in Plymouth County and in Brockton, mm -hmm. and what we've done over over the years since I've been DA, mm -hmm. we've gotten federal grants. You know, the Weed and Seed Grant was an them. old yep. one. Yep. Project Safe Neighborhood was another one. And then uh, that those, unfortunately, the problem with federal grants is that they expire. Right. And when they expire, right. they, don't always, they don't always renew them. So the worst thing that we can do as a community is rely on a grant because that money may not be there later on. So the worst thing we can do is rely on it. Mm -hmm. We need to use it and we need to get our biggest bang for the buck from it. Right. But what we need to do is make sure we, maybe we can move on our own once we get those monies or resources that we can use. So what we've done here, because you know, there's always been, uh, an, uh, there was an uptick in crime probably three years back. Would you say it's drug related? Would you say it's related to addiction? I would say some of it. Uh, is it a balancing? Cause, okay. I, I would say yeah. some of it. Okay. But, but I think a lot of the people that we have to recall, the actual traffickers and the actual dealers of these drugs, mm -hmm. the, the people with the heavy weight of these drugs, mm -hmm. a lot of them, they're not users. They're in it for the money. They're in it for and, the money. And they're right. in it for the money, and they're, they're, they're making their money on the backs of everybody else. Okay. And that's what we have to make sure we hold them accountable, the dealers and the traffickers. We need to help the people in the middle. And also, what we really need to do is do a better job of educating our kids mm. at a younger age to stay away from this poison. And I think that, you know, we've done that over the years in a variety of different things. Like, if you talk to a, a child now that's, uh, say, fifth grade, right. and you talk about cigarettes, they think that is the worst thing in the world. Right. Nicotine is terrible. However, if you talk to them about marijuana, they think, they think it's legal, well, it, is, it will be legal, right. and that it's healthy and organic. There's nothing that's gonna happen, yeah, yeah. that it has no impact on their life. That's absolutely true. And, and, and yeah, I, think, yes. I think what we have to do is we have to teach our kids right. that you know, if you go to a party, say, and you're 18 years old, and somebody hands you a marijuana cigarette, yes. and you smoke it, you're not really sure what you're getting. And that's what we're seeing. Not in this day and age, my Absolutely friend. Absolutely not. So now we right. have marijuana laced with fentanyl or, or God forbid, car fentanyl, which is, you know, an elephant tranquilizer. Right. It's, it's terrible. So, I mean, there's no secret, and I have to broach this because we had your, the, the gentleman, uh, John Bradley, uh, district, the Democratic uh, candidate <clears throat> running against you, has made some very serious uh, allegations with respect to your character and ethics. He said that you ruined the office of the district attorney. What is your comment? Well, he's absolutely wrong. There was a problem in the DA's office six years ago, and the problem was John Bradley, which is why he was terminated. Oh, which that's is why, serious, not terrible. Which was why he was okay. terminated for being a disgruntled employee okay. back then who was sending nasty emails uh, telling me that I was not his child, that he was not my child, and I better respect him better, things along those lines. Mm. And there's a whole history there, which ultimately culminated in him suing me. 
uh, back over the course of the last five years. So, you know, th there's certainly a, a situation that between John Bradley and I, and Bradley, unfortunately, uh, decided, well, he, he's from Boston. I know he, he, he filed, filled out his paperwork that he lived, that he's from when you Plymouth, say, no, okay, but he's not. I, you, so the community needs to understand this. When you say that he's from Boston, yes. what does that, he lives in Boston? Yes. That's where he's from. He lives in the Seaport District in Boston, where he's lived for 25 years. And what I'm sure he told you was that when nobody was running against me in March or so, he made the determination that he was going to run against me. So what he did was he went out and collected signatures like anybody can do, and pursuant to the rules and regulations here in Massachusetts. But what he did was at the very end of the signatures, because initially all of his signatures said he was an independent from Boston, at the very end he filed with the Plymouth Register of Voters down in Plymouth that he was a, a, a Democrat from Plymouth which was not so. So what happened was there was a hearing in front of a, a, the State Ballot Commission, which is a quasi-judicial uh, commission, which has a hearing and they have testimony and things such as that. And there was a hearing and they made the determination that he was indeed not from Plymouth and he was indeed also not what he said he was. And they found his conduct to be deceptive, manipulative, and misleading Wait, okay. to, get on, to get on the ballot. Okay, so District Attorney Cruz, yours, that was the actual language? Actual language. Of the commission? Of the commission. That he was manipulative? Deceptive, manipulative, and misleading. The manner in which he tried to get on the ballot, and he testified the reason why he changed to say that he was going down there because it would be beneficial for him politically to be a Democrat from Plymouth versus an independent from Boston. That's, it, that's, that's a matter of public record. Absolutely. Okay, so I was just trying to find my notes, so I'm interviewing him. He suggested that you had a relationship, uh, and I'm, 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 try, I'm trying to be respectful, sure. so it's not, not uh, a, a nick at you, but he said that you had a relationship, I believe. Uh, if I'm wrong, John, please, I apologize, but I believe he said that you had been on the ballot commission or something like that, and you may have gotten a favorable review, but this wasn't a review for you. This was his. This, this was now I'm understanding this, because I thought that... You, Maybe you had challenged him, or did you there, 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 was, there was a challenge. Oh, okay, okay. There was a challenge. So they call it, I think, an objector is what they call it. Okay. So somebody objected to his, to his, to his, uh, to his signatures. Okay. And then they had this hearing up in Boston back oh. in June. Okay. And that's when the, hear, the State Ballot Law Commission, that I was on 17 years ago. But I don't know these people. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, I believe I left, he did say, I, I, okay. All I right. left that commission 17 years ago. Okay. I have no contact with the State Ballot Law <laughs> Commission regarding their decisions or things such as that. That, quite honestly. So you're saying that he has an, uh, uh, an issue of character based upon that ruling? Absolutely. You're, it, that, you're, a, absolutely. When you, when, you, when you want to be the district attorney, it's all about character and it's all about, it's all about ethics. You cannot be going on, and I suggest to you that really what his conduct was, was he violated Mass General Law Chapter 56, Section 8, voter registration laws. And by saying that he lived somewhere when he did not, under the pains and penalties of perjury. So when you don't live there and you say that you do, yeah, to me that's an issue of character. Okay. And, and therefore, I, I think you have to have character in this job. You can say lots of things about me. I've been here in this job for a really long time. Yeah, 17 years and, and people, you know, you know, sometimes when you make decisions, you know, some people aren't going to be happy. And you have to do the very best you can, and everybody's human. And I, I don't profess to be anything but human, and if I made the wrong decisions over the course of my life, I very well could have. So is, but what you can't yeah. call me is somebody's not telling the truth. Truth, yeah, and I, I, I believe that, that that's the allegation. So, um, you're, so you're saying that basically you're willing to be held accountable. Tell us a little bit about, it's all over, Brockton, about the Richard Gardner, uh, respectfully, mishap. What happened in getting? What happened that he was released? Yeah, they have. You know, we have sexually dangerous laws, which I've been dealing with for the last 17 years, starting with the sexually dangerous person laws. Which, when there was a problem here in uh, Bridgewater, we had a ho terrible homicide, homicide back yes, then. Yep. Ali Zapp was murdered down there yes, because yes. of a, a problem with the law. And I suggest right now that there's a further problem with the law, but that doesn't excuse the mistake that somebody in my office made. There's no question so about it. So you're admitting it. that? Yeah, absolutely. I've said it from the outset. I believe that when you're in charge of an agency, when you are the head of that, when you're the leader of that agency, mm -hmm. if somebody makes a mistake, you have to own that. And then what you have to do is look at the situation and how can I fix it? How can I correct it as best as I can? Mm -hmm. Which is what we've been doing for the last <laughs> two years. This Gardner mistake occurred two years back. During that time period, we have been working very hard to make sure that when he, was found, he, got, he got released, he ended up going to a, a, a library in Quincy 
and charges were, there's a bylaw in Quincy, you can't be a sex offender in the, in the library. Oh, and so okay. what, what we ended up doing was we got in touch with the, the Norfolk probation. He was on probation out of Rhode Island, which originally where his cases came from. And then we talked to the Rhode Island's attorney general and we talked to probation down there. They found his conduct in violation of the Rhode Island laws and they put him back in jail for a year. As that was going along, they transferred where he was sitting from Rhode Island to Massachusetts. Okay. When he was transferred back to Massachusetts doing time, at that point, we filed <coughs> sexually dangerous papers against him, which I do all the time. We mm -hmm. always do that. So you knew you that? Know? So, oh, yeah. We, that were on, began. we were on, on top, top of, of it. The, 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 I have a, a person in my office who missed an email, and I'm not excusing that. You know, that was, that, was, that was a mistake. But the problem is, how do you deal with it? So now what we did, we filed SDP papers, sexually dangerous person papers, mm -hmm. against Gardner. Mm -hmm. There was a hearing which he was found sexually dangerous, but he appealed it, and it went to the, a superior court judge and then to the Supreme Judicial Court. Okay. And where that is right now is that the court said that um, the definition of prisoner, even though it doesn't say you have to be a Massachusetts prisoner, mm -hmm. they're saying that that's what it's confined to. Oh. So, so therefore, it's, a, oh. it's a, how do you interpret that word? I got it. So I got it. It, the only appellate avenue from a, a Supreme Judicial Court decision is to the U.S. Supreme, Supreme Court. Court right. And the only person that can do that is the Attorney General. Uh, and, and we've sent it to them, and we're waiting for that response uh, to make sure that we can try to continue to do our job. But in the meantime, also, I've reached out to the Secretary of EOPS, Executive Office of Public Safety, mm -hmm. Dan Bennett, talked to him about this problem, about the definitional problem, and also the notification problems of sending email after email with threads and people losing right. things. It's, 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 a, it's a problem. So the, legisla the, the legislators here in the Commonwealth will have, will have to make a decision yes. on the, what the true term a prisoner means Correct. In the, in, to prevent this from happening in the future. Yeah, because it can happen. And, I mean, like yeah. I said, people make mistakes. It can happen. I mean, and, and I, it's a terrible situation for it to happen with this guy. I agree with that. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, we have to do what we can to try to rectify and keep people safe. So are you pushing back? So you're accepting responsibility, but are you also pushing back on, I, I thought that you had some involvement in decision in this decision you're saying that this email came by way came to one of your one of my assistant DAs the person the DAs. person who was running the sexual okay, I don't think unit. the community I think the community yeah. realized or at least the thought of the community based upon the, the commercials <clears throat> is that you made the decision yeah. you you flubbed this yeah I'm, I'm sure the commercial does say that but once again okay. it's political season so political take season. it with, take it with a grain of salt the truth of the matter is is that you know uh, an ADA in my office made a mistake the truth of the matter is what a leader does when that occurs is you say, you know what, yeah, we made a mistake, let's fix it. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last two years. That's what we're going to continue to do to make sure we keep people safe from Gardner and all the other sexually dangerous people that are out there. This is not, you know, he's right. not the only one. There's a lot of people well, out there. And we, you're saying with that. That, with that actual term of prisoner, we still have an issue. Well, and, and that also, let's change that so that doesn't occur right. again down the road. Right. Yeah. So, you know, the NAACP, we are the, uh, the strongest advocates in support of civil rights for everyone. I've, a lot of people think it's just uh, African Americans, which is not true. So you, you walk into the arraignment session here in the Brockton District Court, you see a combination, a majority of combination of black and brown. When talking to uh, your opponent, he says that the elimination of the cash bail is where we should go. Uh, when you're looking at this, uh, this large incarceration of people, this kind of debtor's, debtor's jail, I believe is what he said. What's your position on cash bail? Well, I mean, right now, the criminal justice reform just came down probably did, two right. or three months back. Correct. And there were, it's, it's a huge packet of information. Right. And one of the things they dealt with was, was the bail statute and adding yep. in what's the, 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 they call it the Brannigan decision. Mm -hmm. And in that one, it's the financial resources of the defendant. I think that you certainly have to look at that in, in totality of so all the other things. So you're not opposed to that? Oh, oh no, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Okay. I okay. think that, you know, when you look at the, 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 the bail situation, you're really in that dichotomy of what's what's good out there. I think that the I take a not offense, but I take ob objection to the debtor prison thing because I don't see that happening in Plymouth mm. County. I can't talk about nationally. I can't. All I can talk about is here in Plymouth County. That, you know, in the last three or four years, mm -hmm. the, the house correction uh, attendance has gone down from 1,600 to less than 1,000. And so we're talking less people are in jail. And I think a lot of that really has got to do with the drug diversion programs mm -hmm. and things such as that, trying to help people more. Uh, but at the same time, if you were brought to court and you had no prior record mm -hmm. and you, it was a nonviolent offense, if you weren't diverted, which happens to most people, but if you weren't, but if you weren't diverted, more likely than not, they're going to give you a new date and you're going to walk out the door. We're not asking for bail or cash bail on people with no records. We're not asking for cash bail on people on non-jailable offenses. They just turn around, they walk out the door, and we deal with that situation. But I, but I think it's important that we make sure sometimes when they do get, people do get released, mm. is that they also have 
you know, various other things, such as stay away orders, right, 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 or right, uh, right. You, know, you can't go over to that convenience store, you can't do this. I think sometimes that is a positive thing for the community to try to make sure this happen. The example that uh, Attorney Bradley gave us was the, um, the federal system where you go in there and there is no cash bail at all. Are you saying that you would not support that model? Yeah, I would not support that, that model. You would not the, support the, that the, model. Fe the, federal, the federal bail system, I mean, first of all, let, let's look at the overall picture of crime that occurs here in the United States. Yes, sir. Ninety-five percent of the, of the cases that are prosecuted in the United States of America are at the state level. 5% are at the federal level. Mm -hmm. The federal level is a long process. And so when they bring me in to arraign me for a case, they've been working on that case probably for a year. And they have an opportunity to figure things out. Mm -hmm. In uh, state, the state system, things could have happened three hours ago because and I'm being brought arrest. in. Because you know, yeah, arrest. you just right. get arrested and you have to be brought to, for a bail hearing within six hours. Right. So you make sure you get, people get brought and that gets addressed. So I, I think that my, part of my responsibility, and I think we did it with the, all the Dukin problems and mm -hmm. the Farrakh problems, mm -hmm. when we found out that there was a, say John Doe was being held on bail on, mm -hmm. a, on a trafficking case, and even though I still believe that the case may be good on the, against John Doe, mm -hmm. I think it was my obligation, which we did, to bring that person back to court to have another bail hearing in front of a judge. Gotcha. And that person has an opportunity to say, you know what, Here, here's my situation, that woman messed up the drug, the drug certs, so therefore the, you can't rely on them. Where we're at right now, and at the end of the day also, is, is that the, the judges set the bail, not the DAs. So if, if we go in and ask for no bail, the judge could still set a bail if he, he right. or she chose to do that. And I think that you know, we have to look at the totality of the circumstances. How does it affect the defendant? Mm -hmm. How does it and affect the community. the community? And how does it affect the victims? Right. I think it's all of those right. things right there that we need to look at to make sure that we keep people safe and also make sure that people show up in court. Because one of the other you know, things that we've seen, unfortunately, in the last six months or so is some terrible incidents where police officers have been shot and killed, yes, and, they were, yes. and, they, and they're effectuating arrest warrants when that right. happens. Right, right. So um, I think that you know, nobody's got a crystal ball. Nobody, no, I, judges don't have it. We don't have it. Defense attorneys don't have it. Nobody does. And anything well, Somebody's political ads yeah. seem to... <laughs> well, <laughs> once again... I'll be honest with you. Some of the ads political ads. that, right? P political ads. There you go. So uh, yeah, I, we know that you're a Republican, and one of the things that I've always been confused about, I am sort of a law geek. I don't understand why do we have the term... Republican district attorney or Democratic district attorney. Yeah. Can you just speak to that very quickly? Isn't it, shouldn't this just be you're the, just, you're the district attorney? I think so. I, 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 mean, I, I, I think I agree with you. The problem is, is that we run for election. election and, right, right. You know, but I really believe you know, what people should understand is that you know, in Massachusetts, we have 11 elected district attorneys for 14 counties. Or a couple of counties have more than one county. A couple of DAs have more than one county. And um, we all really work well together. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat and I'm a Republican. Right. We sit around, we talk about what's in the best interest of our various communities, what laws would help all of us, how do we divide our pie? So the DNR really doesn't matter at the end it, of the day? Not, you, for, the, for the DAs, I agree with you. I, I don't think it oh, does. Okay. So um, you, you, that's, that's pulling me into this controversy. Elizabeth Warren says that the criminal justice system in the United States now, let me, let me be clear on something. Statistically speaking, black and brown are the lowest in terms of uh, incarceration in, in our Commonwealth in Massachusetts. But she's saying in general, the, the, the criminal justice system is racist. I pose the same question to uh, Attorney Bradley. Is the criminal justice system racist? I think, I think she says it's racist from top to bottom. I think, I, think, well, I, think, I think that was her quote. I, I could be wrong. Okay. But I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's what it was. Okay. And that's where I, I take offense with that. I don't okay. you know because basically you're calling everybody a racist at that right, point. Right, right. You know, so the the police officer on the street, the the prosecutor in the courtroom, the, the judge on the bench. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think everything. I, I don't think you say anything's top to bottom. Right. I think that what we have to do once again, and in our court system, is we are unfortunately the melting pot of society's problems. Right. And and we're not always equipped for mental health issues or drug issues. And how do you deal with that when you don't have various programs or various beds for the people that need to go to, a, say, a mental health facility. You know, I, I, we see people who have serious mental health issues out in our street, and they, have their un, their, they don't have their meds. They may be bipolar. They may be schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. They go down to Bridgewater, say, on a civil commitment, and while they're there, they attack a guard. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, they now have a criminal charge against them. Right. And it's completely changed the parameters of the situation. I think that you know, we, what we need to do is make sure that we have more resources to help the people in our various communities and help the people who are on the streets who obviously, when you see them, if they're out, uh, you stop your car at a red light, say, in Boston, or even around here in Broadway. No, right, right, know, down, right and, outside here. Yes. And, and, yeah. and they're looking for money. Right. It's, it's an incredibly sad situation. And a lot of these people are veterans. 
You know, how, oh, what yeah. does that say about us as a community that's not taking care of the men and the women that served that, that, our nation? Exactly. I, I, yeah. I think we I have to do a, more I from that. I took offense to that, right. We right. have to do more from that, and that's why we're also getting, you know, finally a Veterans Corps here in Plymouth County also, which I'm very happy about. So, uh, Attorney Cruz, uh, District Attorney Cruz, I asked uh, Attorney Bradley, and I, and I have to ask you this question. Do you have anything good to say about John Bradley? He, he, he was in fact, he said no when he, with respect to you, he felt that it, uh, I think, because I, I asked him, I said, well, maybe this is too personal. I kind of think he kind of agreed with that. But in this, all this happened politically across the country. We have to be able to be civil. Yeah. Do you have anything that you would say nice about him or good about him? You know, I, I would say, you know. Because you guys were friends, he said. That, well, that's exactly what I'm going to say. I'm confused by yeah, how I this mean, got this bad. It's I, like you guys were friends. It's, un it's unfortunate. Okay. You know, it, it's, it's unfortunate. And that's what I would say is that there was a time when I considered him my friend. And, and I feel bad about the situation that we're in. Trust me, I never feel good about telling somebody you can no longer work in the office. That's not what I'm about. I want to help people in my office, outside my office. And I feel really bad the road this has gone down. But what this has turned into is really personal and very vindictive on his part. Because as we sit here right now, and you can talk to me about what I'm looking at down the road. Right. In actuality, if you ask what is his vision for our county, I haven't heard it yet. Can we do better? <laughs> we, we have to do better. I, I agree. I, we, I think we, you know what? I mean, we really have to do better. I just, uh, I, when I interviewed, uh, when I interviewed the counselor, I was just saying to myself, why couldn't you all just pick up, before it got to this point, yeah. And I actually, have, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the interview, but I said, why can you all just pick up the phone and straighten this out? And I think for, because for a lot of us in the community, it's like, we don't see, again, and people like get surprised when I say this. Black people are not surprised when I say this. We rarely ever try to get involved with the district attorney's race because a lot of us, are, I'm being honest with you, a lot of us are being prosecuted. Uh, so it's not a race that we really look at, but now that a lot of us have in the last two years. So for us, it's like, uh, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, it seems that the position should be not be political. I agree. And I think that what we've seen, whether it's the Boston race or even here in the race in Plymouth County, it's like now we kind of see that we really, really, it matters. The district attorney is the most powerful law enforcement person uh, in a particular county. Many people say uh, across the Commonwealth, it is the role that really can change someone's life. Uh, so we were just looking to see what you know? What can you do in terms of what happens at arraignment sessions? You spoke about the the cash bail. Um, that uh, it's something that should stay. Yes. Fair, fair enough. Yep. And you spoke about uh, kind of about the the issue of Elizabeth Warren's top to bottom comment about racism. Uh, so I, I I sense that maybe there you, are there some sort of racism that's in the system. I, I think. I mean. I, th I think it's because you know we know that the police system was developed from slavery, so we can't get a, get away from that. And even I heard it's funny because I heard Commissioner Braddon, who was oh I, I always loved him. He gave a clear example of how the police department started in the slavery and how we need a better job, do a better job in terms of policing across the country. I mean, what are your thoughts? I think I think the police have a very difficult and challenging job. They do. I, I think, and I've spoken to uh, recently Commissioner Gross up in Boston. Yes, again, yes, a, yeah, Willie Gross, who's, who's a good a friend of mine. Great, yeah. great guy. He is. Uh, yeah. And yeah. Um, and when you talk to him, he talks about being a street cop in Boston for thirty four years. Yes, I know. You know, I and know, I know. and yeah. you get you. you Unvarnished right. truth from yeah, him. He does. He, tells uh, he, it. he gives it right to you. And right. uh, and I think that you know he was very. Um, I know when the, the governor came up with a proposal for change some of the the, the dangerous of statutes. Right. I know he was a big proponent of uh, creating a law finally for somebody to cut off a GPS off their leg because he, his position I didn't was, know that there was yeah any law. yeah it, it, basically it was a violation of your probation but it wasn't a crime per se. So this new bill will give them a little a little more oomph to make sure that people that do cut it off there's a penalty for that also. District Attorney Tim Cruz has come to the NAACP firm. You want to look at the camera and tell them what's your contact information? Uh, the contact information that I have is uh, datimcruz.com or datimcruz at gmail.com. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, we make sure that uh, we, we work really hard every day and I'd be looking for people's votes on November 6th or before. No, or before the early voting has it's been already had. happened. District Attorney Timothy Cruz, Plymouth County, came to the NAACP firm. You all know we are Brox's Choice for civil rights news. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. Publish, Appreciate publish. it. Thank you. Let our rejoice.